Why Doris Day really was not Hollywood's girl next door in real life. The dark days of Doris Day, the girl next door, had a dark side behind her squeaky clean public image. Doris Day's public image was the one role she could never shake off. Girl Next Door was a label that didn't suit a woman whose life was anything but ordinary. Doris Day, one of the last survivors of the golden age of Hollywood, has died at the age of 97, leaving behind unresolved rumours of a romance with an Ulster movie co-star and an unwanted association in rhyming slang with an East Belfast terrorist godfather. Doris Day was in many ways the most interesting example of this dissonance between the public persona and often not entirely private reality. Day, who had a string of hit records before becoming a superstar of the silver screen in films like Pillow Talk and That Touch of Mink, had been described as a legend of an innocent age in Hollywood with a radiant smile to match her whiter-than-white reputation. But the wholesome Doris Day persona created by her film publicists for The Ohio Girl whose real name was Doris Marianne von Kappelhoff, didn't quite tally with the off-screen reality of a woman who had money problems and three failed marriages behind her. Not that anything soured US moviegoers against their movie sweetheart, and the running joke from Groucho Marx was that he had known her before she was a virgin. What he was referring to was the stark contrast between Day's overbearingly wholesome public image and the messy reality of her private life. She's been through the ringer over the years, survived abusive relationships and bad marriages, four in total, and battled back from ill health, financial ruin and scandal. I've been through everything, she said some years back. I've always said that I was like those round-bottomed circus dolls. You know, those dolls you could push down and they'd come back up. I've always been like that. No matter what happens, if I get pushed down, I'm going to come right back up. Day became the number one choice for female leads in romantic comedies culminating in three sparkling films with her favourite co-star, Rock Hudson. It was those films, as much as anything else, that cemented Day's public image as a wholesome and unspoiled Midwestern gal, to whom a dirty thought had never occurred. But the reality was that by the end of the 1950s, the 36-year-old star was already well into her third marriage. At 16, Doris had wed a trombone player called Al Jordan, with whom she had her only child, a boy called Terry. But the marriage was not a happy one, and Jordan was allegedly both abusive and violent. The couple separated in 1943, and Jordan later committed suicide. By 1946, Day was married again, this time to a saxophonist, George Widler, but the union proved no more successful and they were divorced within three years. In 1951, her romantic fortunes seemed to have finally changed when she tied the knot with independent film producer Martin Melcher. Doris discovered that all was not what it had seemed. Friends like James Garner and Frank Sinatra had long had their suspicions about Melcher, and these proved all too well founded when Day discovered that her husband of 17 years had secretly squandered her $20 million fortune and left her deeply in debt. Up to that point, she'd made over 40 films and as many hit albums, 
but by the late 1960s, flower power and the sexual revolution had begun to make Doris Day seem irrelevant. Other stars were able to adapt, but Day was so indelibly associated with the wholesome housefrau image that there seemed no place for her among the 1960s swingers. But our Doris Day, the beautiful blonde whose sunny screen presence and silken singing voice guaranteed box office and record chart hits in the 40s, 50s and 60s. Glenn Gormley born actor Stephen Boyd, whose real name was William Miller, was clearly smitten with Doris Day. The cleft chin star, who had progressed from the Ulster Group Theatre in Belfast to the big time in Hollywood, acted with Day in the 1962 circus musical Billy Rose's Jumbo. And he made no secret of his admiration for Day, who he said was the most exciting and beautiful actress he had worked with. He once recalled, Doris has a beautiful figure and a wonderful mouth and eyes. She dresses beautifully and she's full of life. In another interview in 1962, Boyd said, I'm amazed at her versatility. I think Doris could do any kind of drama as well, as if not better than anyone else I've ever worked with. She gives so much. I get on well too with her husband, Marty Melcher, who visits the set occasionally. Boyd went further in an interview in 1964 with renowned Hollywood columnist Luella Parsons saying, I love Doris Day. Doris is not considered a sex symbol, but what a woman. Two years on, Boyd was still in raptures about her and in another interview he said Day wasn't the girl next door as many people believed. In fact, she's anything but, he said. She's a movie star down to her twinkly toes, with all the aura, the magnetism and the sex appeal that go with it. It was scarcely surprising Hollywood gossip columnists speculated Boyd was having a romance with Doris Day, who was said to have been keen on him too. Writer Earl Wilson said that the spark started flying on the movie Billy Rose's Jumbo. He said that Day, who was seldom interested in love scenes, appeared to be enjoying the kissing clinches with Steve and insisted on more and more rehearsals. Wilson wrote, I checked the love scene rumour with producer Jose Pasternak, who said, yes, when the director said cut during a scene, they didn't cut. Studio bosses exploited the rumour with an advertisement which proclaimed Doris Day had found a new romance under the big top with Stephen Boyd. The Ulsterman, who died in 1977 at the age of 45, rejected the rumours of an affair, saying, I'm flabbergasted. It's so false and ridiculous. I have no words. More recently, UDA leader and drug dealer Jim Gray, who was murdered by rival loyalists in 2005, was nicknamed Doris Day because of his dyed blonde hair, his gold jewellery and pastel-coloured clothes. He hated the derisory sobriquet, just as Belfast singer Ruby Murray disliked her name becoming synonymous with curry. After quitting the movie business, Doris Day spent most of her time campaigning for animal rights. She set up the Doris Day Foundation, which helped abused animals. Her home was said to have been full of dogs and cats, most of them abandoned strays. Several years ago, she sent a letter of thanks to Armagh charity fundraiser Willie Nugent after hearing that he was assisting dog shelters around the world. As a teenager, Doris had apparently been traumatised when her pet dog was hit and killed by a car while she was walking it, but it was while filming in Marrakesh for Alfred Hitchcock's Man Who Knew Too Much that her fierce commitment to animal welfare was activated. She wrote, You, Willie in particular, have been such a loyal supporter and a good friend to the animals. 
I wanted to personally thank you for your generosity. When I say that we couldn't do it without you, I truly meant it. <laughs>